And so for the mitochondria are more efficient, being able to utilize, you know, the hydrogen gradient and the electrons, you're able to burn fat more efficiently. And then obviously you're cleaning up the mess more efficiently. You know, in terms of like, even when you look at, when you're turning over mitochondrial efficiency, the way I explain it is sort of, you've got two ways. You either optimize what you've got currently, which is keeping them happy with, you know, keeping, um, I guess, oxidative stress byproducts or oxidants under control, like hydrogen peroxide, superoxide, mm. etc. And that's true supporting like catalase, superoxide, dismutase, glutathione, you know, N-acetylcysteine intake to support glutathione being built. Or you increase the density of your mitochondria through biogenesis, so you've got more mitochondria, so you've got more factories. So you either improve the efficiency of the factories, or you build more, or you do both, you improve the efficiency and build more, and you've got the perfect, yeah. you know, I guess, industry for burning fatty acids and glucose. So that's something that, you know, I wish when I was younger, I paid bigger attention to was that, you know, the importance of mitochondria towards uh, energy production. And then obviously that energy production carries over onto appetite and to mood and to recovery. It just becomes one big entangled mess that really when you're on like prep or dieting, keeping oxidative stress, you know, as low as possible within reason, because obviously you still want to have some level of redox happening in the mm -hmm. body or you're going to cause issues with too many antioxidants should be, you know, at the forefront of your recovery protocol. And obviously, you know, sleep plays into that growth hormone, thyroid hormone and everything like that. But if you've got, you know, mitochondria, ironically, as part of the electron transport chain, they pump out a load of oxidants in the process. And our body has, you know, evolved in that symbiotic relationship to create antioxidants to clean up their mess. So they give us energy and we give them somewhere to live. Yeah. Um, if we're going to, you know, view the whole, you know, calories in, calories out equation, you know, we briefly touched on it that when you get at the like very crux of it, it's actually your food's giving you electrons and the electrons are mm -hmm. feeding into the electron transport chain and obviously the hydrogen pump. It's got nothing to do with like, oh, well, one gram of carbs has four calories and one gram of fat has nine. You know, at the very basic density of it it's these carbons hydrogens oxygens whatever are giving x amount of electrons into your body <clears throat> and so for the mitochondria are more efficient at being able to utilize you know the hydrogen gradient and the electrons you're able to burn fat more efficiently and then obviously you're cleaning up the mess more efficiently so this prep definitely put it down to paying attention to keep an oxidative stress under control with antioxidants using supplements like PQQ and CoQ10 to help mm. increase the number of mitochondria. So PQQ is what's called a pseudo vitamin and helps to influence how our body regulates and creates mitochondria inside our cells. CoQ10 being one of the antioxidants that helps the mitochondrial efficiency. Mm -hmm. Is that is that um, ubiquinone or ubiquinol or a mix of both? So, so Anyone under the age of 40 could probably get away with ubiquinone, mm -hmm. which is, I think, the oxidized form. I always get the two of them mixed up. The oxidized form, and then I think the reduced form is ubiquinol. Ubiquinol, yes. yeah, that's right. And so ubiquinol <coughs> gets converted from ubiquinone to ubiquinol, which is obviously the, the substrate that we use more efficiently. <coughs> If you're under 40, the enzyme that converts ubiquinone to ubiquinol works relatively well. When you get above the age of 40, that enzymatic efficiency drops. They've done studies on this. Mm -hmm. So that's where taking, you know, like Kaneka ubiquinol is often, you know, recommended by people, but it's more so if you're over 40. You get away generally with using ubiquinone. But the other side of it is, Oral ubiquinone has really poor bioavailability. So when you take a, you know, as a, a capsule, <clears throat> I think the bioavailability is about 10% overall. So it is quite low versus ubiquinol. With the other side of it, then, you know, I've done regular, you know, four week cycles of MOTC um, over yeah. the last year. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> so I done five milligrams of Mott C for four weeks, took a four week break, done a f- another four weeks of five milligrams. And then pretty much every month since then, just one five milligram sort of burst dose each month. The problem with Mott C that people need to be aware of is that it acts like methotrexate. So it is a folate blocker. So how it improves mitochondrial biosynthesis is by blocking folate transport like methotrexate. So oh, so that's a, why you take four weeks off. So you really need to supplement with active folate mm-hmm. when you're using MOTC because of that uh, side to it. Otherwise, you're going to end up with potential mood issues, mood disturbance, you know, all the sort of symptoms of low folate and low methylation. Yep. Um, between those two, they were sort of the key things that, you know, I paid attention to driving mitochondrial number up between the PQQ, the MOTC, and then, you know, regularly taking like liposomal glutathione, mm-hmm. or the heart stack product that I developed with all the antioxidants, just really getting down to the, the nitty gritty on keeping on top of internal organ health. And then your body just follows with it. So, so. About one and a half years ago, I made a video called the Mitochondrial Support Stack. And it's very good to see that, at least besides me, somebody now is almost following that to the T um, and getting great results. Uh, I did not include the, the SLUPP because that was not a thing, but Mod C, five milligrams twice per week, um, B vitamins to help support these kinds of processes. Um, glutathione, right? Injectable, whether that's 600 milligrams three times per week or 800 milligrams intravenously. And, um, you know, just making sure that the antioxidant uh, status is so high with ubiquinol and PQQ, pyriloquinoline uh, quinone. Uh, yeah. I, I said this a thousand times, so now I can finally pronounce it. <laughs> did you um, did you take like 20 milligrams servings of the PQQ twice per day with about 100 to 200 milligrams ubiquinol and then shilajit fulvic acid to facilitate absorption? Or did you skip the shilajit? I haven't taken shilajit in a while, but I have some there that I often add into coffee in the morning time. <clears throat> but yeah. the PQQ that we have, we've added by operating for to facilitate the, okay. the right. absorption in the intestine under 20 milligram tablets. So two 20 milligram tablets per day. Um, the other thing, I, you know, and I, from the notes we talked about like NMN or NAD, or again, if you're taking nicotinic acid, flush niacin, that's gonna help with your NAD levels. And it's, you know, having a, enough of a balance between NAD plus and reducing NADP, you know, there's a fine balance between the two of them. Mm. Um, Methylene blue, I see in the notes there, like mm-hmm. methylene blue, I'll use two or three times per week, which again, <clears throat> on one side, like super oxygenates your cells and acts like an endogenous antioxidant as well as, yep. you know, as MAO inhibitor properties as well that helps with mood. Um, I guess, you, you know, the problem is if, if you don't really understand, like I think the the really key point to take away here is if you start increasing your mitochondrial number, but the underlying stress or oxidative stress is really high, you're just setting yourself up for a massive bonfire. So yeah. you, just create you, you more know, oxidative stress. You're just creating more of the guys that create more oxidative stress. You're just running yourself further towards disease than away from it. So the two of them have to be done in tandem to get the benefits, not just, oh, well, I'm going to take PQQ and MOTC to improve my mitochondria. You'd be better off putting strategies in play to reduce oxidative stress first and then start playing off the increased numbers. Am I yeah. am I wrong that um, the relevance here is people that lift would have less mitochondrial density versus someone who does aerobics? So the interior, you know, <clears throat> doing aerobic exercise increases mitochondrial number. Um, as far as I remember, it tends to be... Um, slow, longer duration cardio improves mitochondrial Makes number, sense. I think. Okay. Uh, no, don't quote me. That, but was I what, think it's, that was my understanding. I think that's what increases the number. But obviously then doing that type of cardio does induce a level of oxidative stress as well Correct. because of yeah. how how the oxidative. energetics are from it, from oxidative phosphorylation. So, you know, it's 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 something that I don't even think some of the pro bodybuilders pay attention to currently, but you know, maybe from what we're sort of speaking about and the relevance of it, 
eventually sort of start realizing that you improve mitochondrial efficiency, you can eat more because your energy, yep. you know, kinetics improve massively. And I think that's sort of where, like, even now when someone asks me oh, about prep or are you doing a show, are you dieting? I've sort of lived this way since the celiac diagnosis and correct and all that sort of stress or oxidative stress from the celiac disease that it's now more so like daily living and lifestyle than, oh, well, I'm on prep. Like, yeah. you know, if if this had been like a few years ago, I'm three days out, it would have been like, oh, God, I'm three days out. How am I, <laughs> how am I getting through today? And, you know, you'd be hyper-focused and I need to do this, 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 this. Now it's just like, yeah, I'm going to turn up on Sunday and get on stage. It's not, you know, it's it's... It's been really enjoyable when your body operates this way, both yeah. cognitively and physically. The, the cognitive part, honestly, if anyone's listening to this and they're on prep and your brain is like mush, there's a big problem. Um, you know, now I've realized you shouldn't feel any different, you know, mentally, physically with less body fat. You just got less body fat. You know, so yeah. we went away to a spa weekend for Morgan's birthday there on Sunday. And, you know, a guy goes to me after I get out of sauna, oh, what body fat percentage do you think you are? And I said to him, I don't know, I said to him, the lowest I've ever been on like a, <coughs> a bod pod, you know, the, the air displacement was 6%. And the lowest on the last prep when I'd done the in-body sort mm -hmm. of electro impede and scanner that they use for like kidney surgeries mm -hmm. was at 43 you know, I said to him, I'm probably not far off where I am back there. But I said to him, if I'm honest, I don't even feel like it. Because he was like, oh, do you compete? I said, well, yeah, I competed a few weeks ago and I'm going to compete next weekend. He's sort of scratching his head like, oh, well, why are you here if you're competing? Like, you know, it doesn't make sense that you're as, you know, you've got as much vitality as what you have now speaking to me. And, I, you know, I, I just explained to him that this has just become a lifestyle as opposed to, you know, this is a mm -hmm. big, serious goal. 